These are the northern plains. They have changed a little in the past several thousand years, but its inhabitants have changed even more. Some have diminished in number, like the deer and the elk. Some almost disappeared, like the bison and the eagle. And some don't live here anymore, like the wolf and the bear. Yet there is one kind who lives here in far greater numbers than ever before the human people. But there was a time when people were far outnumbered by other forms of life here on the plains. During that time, those people were part of the land, not apart from it. And those people were called Indians. The story you're about to see is about one group of those people. But it is not a story of any particular tribe but of many tribes, of many nations. To be exact, it is a story of one kind of person who was part of the life of many ancient nations here on the plains. This is a story of the male Indian, the hunter and warrior. Until the late 1800s, many of the plains tribes were nomadic hunters, more so after the arrival of the horse. Hunting was an absolute necessity. It was the way to provide food and to get the materials needed for shelter and clothing. Therefore, it was the hunter who provided food and obtained the materials for shelter and clothing. For the people of the plains, the land was not a wilderness. It was home. They were not afraid of it because they knew and understood it. The land was a source of life for all living things, including people. And only someone who did not understand this relationship would think that the land was savage or wild. Furthermore, since all of the tribes were not always friendly to one another, it was sometimes necessary to fight an enemy. When it was time to fight, either as an aggressor or as a defender, it was the warrior who did the fighting. The hunter and warrior were different only in purpose. The hunter was the provider. The warrior was the protector. Otherwise, it was one and the same person. Among the Plains tribes, it was the male who filled the dual role of hunter and warrior. In fact, since the two roles were filled by the same person, it would be more appropriate to say hunter-warrior. Hunter-warriors did not suddenly materialize as if by some magic, nor did Plains Indian males suddenly turn into hunter-warriors at some point in their lives. Being a hunter-warrior was a vital societal role. It was born of necessity and developed by practicality. And each generation of hunter-warriors passed on its knowledge and skills to the next. The time is about 1860 and a hunter-warrior has decided to spend a few days with his two sons in a secluded camp before rejoining the main village. The father's name is Seize the Wolf, a war leader among his people. His sons are Little Elk and Badger. Their time together will enable Seize the Wolf to enhance and refine his son's skills as they learn to be hunter-warriors. 
It is a training process that was started at the age of four and five years old. Little Elk and Badger are now 14 and 15, and they are already quite skilled and self-sufficient, but they still have much to learn. Part of that learning process is to continually review and practice what they already know. Like the horse, the bow and arrow were readily identified with the Plains Hunter Warrior. Indeed, even before the horse, the bow and arrow were the main weapons for hunting and warfare. Though they did lose some significance to the white man's firearm, they still continued to be an important part of any hunter warrior's arsenal well into the late 1800s. The hunter warrior was responsible for making his own weapons, and none required more precise work than the arrow. Willow, chokecherry, and gooseberry stalks, about the size of a man's little finger, were used for arrow shafts. The shaft was measured from the elbow to the tip of the finger, plus the width of a hand. Then it was cut, peeled, and straightened. A straight shaft was critical for accuracy, which also meant they had to be the same size or width from end to end. A notch for the string was cut in one end. And a deep groove for the arrowhead in the other. From about 1840 on, Iron heads were popular among the Plains tribes. Iron was obtained mainly from trade with the whites. The arrowhead, or the point, was secured in place with hide glue and by sinew wrapping. Part of the learning process for the young would-be hunter warrior was to observe very carefully. The feathers or fletching were also lightly glued in place and then securely wrapped with sinew. Most arrows had two feathers. Feathers from turkey, turkey buzzards, ravens, ducks, and geese were most often used.
Without feathers, arrows would fly very erratically. Building a bow began with the right kind of wood. Hardwoods, such as ash, choke cherry, and oak, were preferred for their strength and flexibility. Seize the wolf takes his sons to a grove of choke cherry. He was looking for a young tree, about the size of a grown man's forearm. It must also be as long as a man is tall. He finds the right tree and explains why he has chosen this particular one. Oh, this is the average that one. Well, I'm not going to choke on hang hey. I'm skin a yash for hang trunk at you. Little Elk already knows that choke cherry trees have other good things to offer in late summer. He shares his find. They will remember the location of this tree and return to cut it down in the winter when the sap is down. Then it will be allowed to dry for five years in order for it to season properly. Seize the wolf takes another properly seasoned stave and begins to work. Most of a morning's effort results in a rough outline of a bow. By the afternoon, the shape and dimensions are well defined and the string notches are glued. Only a few small refinements are needed, but Badger and Little Elk can see that this bow is ready to use. Sees the wolf test its bend and flexibility. But even the best bow cannot be effective unless the hunter warrior can shoot it accurately. Under their father's watchful eye, the boys practice. They know that a hunter warrior who cannot shoot accurately will not be able to adequately provide for his family or protect them from enemies. Seize the Wolf shows them the level they must strive to achieve. As his father told him, a man will only be as good as he will ever be with a bow, only when he dies. Badger and Little Elk are given every opportunity to learn and gain valuable experience. Exploring and observing their surroundings are the best ways to do that. In this way, they will learn that they are a part of the land, like every other living thing, and not apart from it. What appears to be a leisurely walk is actually a serious lesson. Badger can smell the sweet sage. He hears the distant cry of a hawk. 
The tracks he sees tells him that a deer has just walked along this same ridge. As he pauses to look at the river below, he knows he is not alone on the land. Little Elk has also found a set of tracks, higher on the same ridge. He can see where a deer might have stopped on an outcropping overlooking the valley. Here, Little Elk yields to an entirely boyish and timeless impulse. And not only once. But his playfulness has roused the black-tailed buck from his afternoon bed the same buck who left his tracks on the ridge. Both Badger and Little Elk will remember where this buck lives, especially if the coming winter is harsh and fresh meat becomes scarce. They trail the buck down into the valley, and they find where he probably always crosses the river. They will remember that, too. As they continue to explore, they come upon another inhabitant of the plains, the sage hen, a nervous sage hen. She takes wing and lands when she finally feels safe from the two young hunters. But they have carefully watched where she has gone. A bow is not the only weapon available to the hunter. Small animals like the rabbit and squirrel have their own particular habits and territories. Knowing this, the hunter can use a weapon better suited to small game. A springy sapling, a bit of cord, and two sticks can be as effective as a bow and arrows. The bracing stick is pounded into place. The snare line is tied to the sapling. The trigger is set. But will it work? Badger knows it will. He resets the snare and hides the loop in the grass. the wolf has taught his sons that survival does not have to be difficult. All it takes is knowledge.
building a brush shelter is a relatively simple task. But it is important because the knowledge of even the simplest things can make a difference. Knowledge can be the difference between being cold or warm, or being wet or dry. Knowledge can mean the difference between living and dying. Building a fire is also a simple task. All it takes is perseverance and knowing just when to blow on the hot, powdery embers. The knowledge to build a fire means a cozy evening by the fire and a deliciously cooked sage hen. have been a part of the life of Plains tribes since the late 1600s. They enhanced the existing nomadic lifestyles. No one felt the horse's impact more than a hunter-warrior. In fact, the prevailing image of the Plains Indians is of the horse-mounted warrior. Without the horse, a man was still a hunter-warrior, but with it, he was far more effective, far more formidable. The hunter-warrior painted his horse to demonstrate the partnership of man and horse. Certain symbols, like the circle which represented life and the lightning bolt, were universal. But the way in which they were used was unique to each individual partnership of horse and man. For example, the lightning symbol attached to the circle of life was a prayer for the horse to have the speed of the lightning and for its rider to have the power of lightning, so that together they could protect the most precious things of life, the family, the people, and their way of life. The rectangular mark tells that sees the wolf as a war party leader. Stripes on the legs are achievement marks, brave and significant deeds performed by horse and rider together.
stylized hoof prints. Each one represents a successful horse raid, one in which many horses were taken from an enemy. Blue hailstones, another prayer for the warrior to have the stinging power of the hailstone. Now both horse and rider are ready for the hunt or the warpath, and boys dream of how they will paint their horses one day. Arrows, knife and war club, bow, buffalo hunting lands, and war lands. All are only extensions of the hunter warrior. But any weapon, no matter its size, shape, or use, does not magically turn a boy or a man into a hunter-warrior. Practice does that. Especially under the watchful eye of a patient teacher. And as the boys are beginning to realize, everything is not as easy as their father makes it look. And Seize the Wolf will teach his sons until the weapons become as much a part of them as their own hands. training moves up a level. As the war leader of his village sees the wolf as riding out on a scouting trip, it is always important to know where one's enemies are. He will take Little Elk along on this particular trip. Any time and any situation is always a good opportunity for an aspiring hunter warrior to learn. Badger will remain behind the lesson for him is that it is equally important to defend the camp. The land is alive, and it is the source of all life. And no matter how anyone moves, on four legs, on two, by flying, swimming, or crawling, we move with the land. If we know this, then our lives will be easier. That knowledge is the basis for wisdom. To survive, we must be wise. We must know when, how, and where to hunt. We must also know our enemies, where he lives, how he moves, how he fights. We cannot forget that an unknown enemy is the most dangerous of all. For all of these reasons, it is vital that each generation of hunter warriors know the land and know all about everyone and everything that is part of it. As he rides, Seize the Wolf looks for signs, signs that will tell him who has also used this trail when he passed and in which direction.
One sign will tell a story of the old lone elk, no longer part of the herd. Other signs will tell of the group of black-tailed bucks heading for water. But on this day, Sees the Wolf is looking for one particular sign, and he has found it. A sign that tells him that the largest inhabitant of the plains is nearby the great bison, the one whose existence is life itself to the people of the plains. It is not difficult to track the bison. The trail shows that the nearby herd is small. But whether there is one bison or many, the hunter must always approach carefully. The bison are always on the lookout for danger, and one fully grown outweighs a horse and can gallop faster. With these things in mind, Seize the Wolf approaches cautiously, knowing that the small herd is probably over this next hill. He leaves Little Elk to watch the horses while he carefully and quietly sneaks up to the crest of the hill. bison are there, a small herd of about a hundred. Seize the Wolf has seen many bison in his lifetime, but each time the sight of them quickens his heart. He brings Little Elk up for a look. And they plan a route that will take them close. It is time for Little Elk's first buffalo chase. They mount and move down the slope and up a hidden gully. The horses are eager. Weapons ready, they angle into the herd. Bison react and begin to run, but Seize the Wolf has already picked out the slow runner, and his aim is true. The chase is over in a few heartbeats. The hunters begin to follow the wounded animal. It has finally collapsed far from the herd. Its life and death must be given a purpose, and part of it is to teach a young hunter that each life is sacred. The hunter does not take such a life joyfully, but with respect, humility, and gratefulness, as this offering of sage signifies. The great bison is given thanks for his life. In return, the hunter will always honor its spirit. They have butchered the bison and hidden the meat and will return with drag poles to take it back to camp. But in the meantime, they have made a significant discovery an enemy village very close to their hunting grounds. 
This village must be scouted to leave the horses well away from the camp and proceed on foot. slip past the outer line of the camp's sentries. Now they are near the north edge of the enemy camp. Caution and silence are their best weapons at this moment. Seize the wolf knows that he cannot teach his sons how to be hunter warriors by keeping them away from difficult things. To sneak up to the edge of an enemy village to count the warriors and horses is not easy even for the most experienced warriors. Therefore, it is one of the very best ways to teach a boy to be a warrior. Anyone can follow a wide trail and do the easy things. To be a warrior, one must take the most difficult and dangerous trail. Seize the wolf motions for Lilop to have a look into the enemy camp. Now it is time to leave, and for a second time, they must elude the outer line of sentries to get back to their horses. Sees the wolf spots a sentry about to cross their path. They must move swiftly or be seen. Little elk stops and hides just in time. He remembers something his father once said, that the eyes have the power to draw the eyes. So he knows that he must not look up as a sentry passes by. For a few more heartbeats, he lays silently until he is certain the danger is past. Then he rejoins his father. Now, as they are safely away from the village, Little Elk thinks of his first encounter with an enemy warrior, and he is alive to tell about it. But danger wears many faces. One of them has changed in the form of a new kind of people. Resting by a stream, Seize the Wolf and Little Elk suddenly find themselves face to face with changing times. Warrior instincts take over. Seize the Wolf has heard stories of these people. Many are beginning to come onto the plains, and most of the stories he has heard about them are not good. Seeing their weapons, he strings his bow. It is easy to see 
that they are not like any of the people who inhabit the plains. They are strangers, strangers who walk the land uneasily. Seize the wolf and little elk follow the strangers to their camp. It is the first time either of them have seen these kind of people. Curiosity runs high. Obviously, these people are a family traveling from one place to another, perhaps only passing through. Did you get the water? They cannot understand the words they hear any more than they can understand why these strangers are here. And this is yet another lesson for Little Elk. The white man's wagon looks small in the distance. Sees the wolf watches and wonders how many more of these strangers will come and what that will mean for his sons. It is time to go home and prepare to rejoin the main village. Sees the wolf is satisfied the journey has provided valuable lessons. Little Elk has hunted buffalo, scouted an enemy camp, and he has seen the faces of strangers. Badger has learned as well that it is just as honorable, and perhaps more important than anything else, to defend the camp. Hunter warriors do not magically appear they are carefully taught the necessary knowledge and skills by those who have ridden that path before them. And sometimes that path has an interesting turn. Sees the wolf has done his part, and for one more generation, there will be at least two more hunter warriors. There were many tribes which lived on the plains, Pawnee, Comanche, Arapaho, Arikara, Cheyenne, Crow, and Sioux, to name just a few. The way they lived, their lifestyle, meant that the hunter-warrior was important and necessary. The hunter-warrior, the provider and protector, was above all a human being. He was a man. He was someone's son, 
uncle, brother, father, or friend. He grew up to be a husband, a father, a grandfather. He had feelings, he made mistakes, he loved his family. He was, as I said, human. I hope you enjoyed the story. Chantewa Shtea, Napechi Yuza, below.